the answer. Okay, Mike. Okay, well, thank you, Kathy. Uh, well, um, it's kind of strange doing garden presentations on Zoom. I was hoping that we'd be able to meet in person. But uh, yeah, I have been uh, in the nursery business since high school. Um, I will be honest with everybody. One of my weakest points in the nursery industry is fruit trees. I didn't like fruit trees, didn't want to help anybody with fruit trees. <laughs> I just basically want to help people with uh, trees and uh, shade trees and shrubs. But I have a mentor from Dave Wilson Nursery, Tom Spellman, who taught me everything I know about these trees. And once I started learning about them and helping people develop orchards and how successful they are, we really began loving fruit trees. So now fruit trees and edibles are more forte. So what I'd like to start off with is basically to explain to everybody that, you know, as you go into the supermarket, you, you walk into a store and you look off to the right and you see these beautiful red Santa Rosa plums. And what gets you is the presentation. But when you actually eat them, you, you, most people don't like them. They're either too tart, too sour, they just don't taste good. And that's basically because most of the fruit that arrives in the grocery stores are picked too early because they have to be able to store well. So during this pandemic or even back when we had that bad drought, Victory Gardens are starting to happen again. And part of being in Victory Garden is going ahead and putting uh, fruit trees in your garden. Um, we, we taught people how to do backyard orchards. And what is a backyard orchard? Well, we consider it high density planting. And what we basically mean is if I have a 10 foot 10 by 10 foot area, I'm gonna plant about four trees in a 10 foot by 10 foot area. Uh, another way to do backyard orchard and how to use fruit trees in a landscape is you could actually put a screen up and you can plant these trees fairly close near each other uh, to either use them as a windbreak or also to block your ugly neighbors. But at the same time, you're getting fruit to boot. So basically when you do a 10 foot by 10 foot uh, garden and you're gonna go ahead and plant four trees, you basically wanna plant trees that are gonna have different ripening dates. Now, a lot of these fruit trees do have different ripening dates. Uh, you basically have very early season, you have early season, you have mid season, and then you have late season and very late season. A lot of times we have come up with a lot of different varieties of fruit trees uh, that can ripen basically all summer long and partly in the fall. You know, there's peaches and we do have plums that may even ripen all the way up till September, October. So finding, um, uh, and the way to start backyard orchards is finding the right location. Know whether or not you have full sun, uh, half day sun, know your soil types, is my soil dry, is my soil wet? Because we do have fruit trees basically that are grafted on different rootstocks and, and to come up with the varieties and then also come up with the hardiness of the trees. And what's very important on these rootstocks is that some of these rootstocks require dry soils and some may require wet soils and some of them are disease resistant. So that's why coming to a nursery to buy your fruit trees is the best place to go because we do carry uh, quite a few selections to help accommodate your needs. So basically right now in the nursery we're probably involved in more of the bare root end. And these are bare root trees that we planted into five gallon containers. So basically, if you were to take a tree out of the five gallon container, you're just gonna have basically just a root system because they're not fully rooted in the pots. We just planted them probably about a month ago, uh, right about early January. Uh, so basically, when you actually are taking your tree and you're planting them into the ground, the main thing you want to make sure you're doing, especially if it's a bare root tree, is you're going to have to irrigate them at least twice a day, you know, morning and afternoon. you got to keep that root zone moist in order for it to pop out of dormancy. That's the reason why this time of year we carry bare root fruit trees uh, because of the fact that it's easier to plant. And the reason we do it is because January and February are supposed to be our wettest months. But unfortunately out here, we're not getting the rain that we need. Even though we got a lot of rain that got us out of the severe drought conditions, 
we still need uh, to keep our soil moist till these things pop out. Now, what's very important also is some trees do need pollinizers. And when you are doing uh, an orchard, you gotta know which trees need also pollinization because when you're doing the orchard, whatever's gonna pollinize, let's say you have a, a, a Santa, Satsuma plum and that needs a pollinizer with the Santa Rosa plum, you gotta make sure that Satsuma is planted right close near the Satsuma plum because bees, can only travel up to 12 feet before they land. So basically, if you don't have the room, you gotta just make sure your, whatever's the pollinizer has to be at least 12 feet from the tree that needs to be pollinized. If you can go closer, that's gonna probably be the best thing. And even if we do sell you a tree that uh, is self-fruitful, uh, it still needs bee activity. So you, um, you know, sometimes if the, the tree doesn't get enough pollinization, Sometimes that basically affects the fruit. So basically, once you get these trees planted, you don't want them to produce fruit for probably the first two to three years. Once you get, you've got to get, had to let them grow. And the way to do it is by feeding them. Now, I'm always a big fan of feeding them with a product called Grow Power Plus, and it's basically a nitrogen fertilizer. And this is my Grow Power Plus. And what I do is I start feeding my fruit trees right after I plant them, pretty much. I'll use about two tablespoons of this per foot of height of tree, and I will start feeding my trees once a month. Why I feed them with the nitrogen fertilizer? Because I don't want to wait too many years to get fruit on them. I figure if I use this fertilizer right here and I do it every month, I'm going to get my trees growing faster. This is basically more nitrogen. It has about 5% nitrogen in it. And I'm using it strictly to get my trees to grow fast. Once I'm happy with tree size of my trees, then I'm gonna be ready to concentrate on fruit. So let's just say, for argument's sake, one of you come to me and say, Mike, I want my tree no matter, I've kept down at 10 feet. Then I may say, okay, let your trees grow up to 12 feet. Once we hit 12 feet, then the following year, we'll feed it with a micronutrient fertilizer, which is called Grow Power Flower and Bloom. This is the one I'll use once in January and then again in August. And this is what I'm using strictly to get my trees to produce fruit. But even though the second number, the first number is the nitrogen, the second number is your phosphorus. That phosphorus in this bag of fertilizer is what's basically gonna help those trees to bloom. But that's not what I'm really selling the, the, the fertilizer for. On the back of the bag, it has a lot of micronutrients that fruit trees require. Without the micronutrients, you're not gonna get the best looking fruit off your trees. You know, you'll still fruit, but the quality may not be there or the flavor might not be there. But I'm using this strictly as uh, micronutrients for flavor and quality of fruit. But you get, um, because I don't care what the leaves look like as the trees grow and start to produce fruit because one thing I'm growing these trees for is for fruit production. And what we have to educate ourselves is some of the leaves look a little yellowish or whatever, who cares? As long as I'm getting flowers and fruit. We have, fruit trees have no ornamental value in my yard. I'm strictly growing it for fruit production. So then after you harvest your fruit, and this is where it goes back to the backyard orchard. Doing backyard orchards where you're doing a 10 foot by 10 foot area, as long as you're willing to do the work, and that's the fertilization and the pruning. But after I get the fruit, we do our pruning right after fruit harvest. And you get your loppers out there and you start cutting these trees back in the summer after you harvest the fruit. That creates lower branching that turns into fruit and wood the following year. And I know a lot of folks always tell me about size, ask me questions about size control of the trees. Well, how big do I need to let my trees grow? It's totally up to you as an individual. Um, I'm six feet tall. So whatever I can reach from the ground, that's how big I wanna get my trees uh, prune, uh, kept. Let's say some of you are five feet high. Maybe keeping it at five feet is, is good enough. 
The bottom line of doing this backyard orchard is never climbing a ladder to gather your fruit. You mainly want to do all your pruning, all your fruit harvest from the ground up. We've been taught so many times to basically do our pruning in January. And the reason we were taught that is because the farmers were basically busy pruning in January. Well, why is the farmers pruning, pruning in January? Because they're busy harvesting fruit all summer long. Us as a homeowner in the backyard, we, we could do something different where we could keep our trees down low. We could plant more trees in our yard because we're keeping them small and we're getting fruit to boot. Now, coming to find out, farmers are now starting to do what we've been educating people for quite a few years to do, is now they're going around and keeping their trees down by size. So now they're starting to prune their trees in the summertime after fruit harvest. I believe they have guys going through the orchards, picking the fruit, and the guys are coming by and pruning the trees at the same time because it's getting to the point now where it is kind of getting dangerous to gather your fruit. And for safety reasons, you just stay by on ground and just go ahead and pick, pick your fruit. Now, once you get your orchard planted, and like I said, there's so many different ways to do your backyard orchard. And I mean, like I said, you could plant trees in a row, you know, you could take a spot in your yard and just plant them. You don't have to plant them 20 to 25 feet apart. And, I, I mean, plant them closer, but just make sure your ripening dates are a little bit different. So as you go ahead and continue on with your watering and everything, once these trees are actually in the ground for about a year, what you're going to actually do is you're going to cut back your water to twice a week, three times a week, once these trees been in the year. If you're doing bare root and you're just planting now and they're still bare root, Remember, your watering is going to be twice a day till the leaves pop out. And once the leaves pop out, you go every other day. Then during the cooler months, you'll go every three days. And then once those trees are in the ground for a year, it's the same thing. You'll go twice a week, three times a week. Now, if you buy trees that are already established in the buckets, in the five gallons, and they have a good root system and good root ball, then you're going to basically go ahead and just water those trees every other day during the warmer months and every three days during the cooler months. And then of course, once they're in the ground, they go back for a year, they go back to twice a week to three times a week. Now twice a week, three times a week is basically gonna be depending on the weather. Uh, most of your fruit trees are gonna have roots right to the surface. So most of your watering is actually could be done either with a sprinkler system, drip irrigation system or bubbler heads. At that point, I don't care how you water them as long as they're getting water. But when they're young, I do like to see you out there with a the garden hose if you can, give them a good drink of water. Only when they're established, it's okay with maybe with a sprinkler system, uh, drip irrigation or bubble heads. Because by then they're established, your roots are right to the surface. And at that point, I don't uh, care how they get watered as long as you know they are getting watered. Now, I know a lot of us out here in California have experienced a lot of hot summers and stuff like this. So what's also very important, especially including with avocado trees and citrus trees, if I ever have those in my orchard, always remember if I'm planting citrus, citrus has to be separate from my peaches, plums, nectarines, because citrus is gonna be a little bit more water efficient than these trees. Um, Avocados, I'm fine with planting avocado trees with my peaches and plums because those trees can tolerate moisture as long as it's not wet feet. It's just the citrus, I wanna make sure they're, they're separate. I know a lot of folks that wanna do uh, uh, orchards, they wanna do peaches and plums, but they also wanna integrate citrus in there. And citrus, your, your oranges and things in that nature uh, won't do really well with your deciduous fruit trees. But what is very important is uh, tree trunk paint on your fruit trees. Um, this is basically what I call a suntan lotion for fruit trees. And this keeps your trees from burning. Really good for avocados, good for uh, citrus, all your fruit trees actually. I used to not recommend it for citrus, 
but now that I'm starting to see people's citrus burning in their gardens, I mean, I'm now starting to recommend this because there's no reversing it once your citrus burns or your other trees burn or your avocados burns. Possibly you could end up losing your trees <clears throat> because they burn. I'd especially like using it on cherry trees and apple trees. And just to explain a little bit, if you guys like cherry trees, there are low chilled varieties of cherry trees now that you could actually plant in your yard. And the bet, and there's two that come to mind, Lapin's cherry and Royal Crimson cherry. Uh, those two cherries are very low chilled. Where before we could not grow cherries in, out here because we were not cold enough. Well, you, now um, Dave Wilson Nursery has developed uh, a couple cherries that are self fruitful that will produce out here. I prefer the Royal Crimson and the Lapin's Cherry. I've been carrying uh, the Royal Crimson now, or I've known about the Royal Crimson now for about five years. And I haven't, and Lapin's has probably been around about seven years. And they're both low chilled varieties, both so fruitful, don't need a pollinizer, <coughs> and they produce like crazy. And um, haven't had anybody have any complaints about them. So those would be my two favorite cherries to try with uh, if you want to grow cherries out here because they are very low chilled. Talk about apples. Apples are very forgiving in chill factors. Um, I tell people, don't worry about the chill factor on apple trees um, because they're, they're very forgiving. And for those that don't know what the chill factor is, it's trees that require so many hours of winter chill, but that's the root system. So sometimes on our tags, you'll see some 800 hours cold winter chill. Well, that has to do with your soil temperature. And if it's 800 hours, you don't want to grow it out here. <coughs> Excuse me. So my recommendation with chill factors, if you live in the San Fernando Valley or even in the Santa Clarita, area, I'm recommending probably about 500 hours or less is good for us. Uh, because like I said, that is soil temperature. Anything above 500 hours, don't buy the tree because then you're really borderline. If it's 600, you're borderline. If it's seven or 800, definitely don't purchase it because it definitely needs that chill factor. Okay. So another thing that we also are also really concerned about when we're growing fruit trees is diseases, insects, and stuff like that. Well, trees do get diseases and insects, so we do have to spray for them. <coughs> and so when they're dormant, I always recommend the concentrate, but we were out of the concentrate, so I got the ready to use. This is Monterey horticultural oil. And what this is, what I love about this, when this was first introduced to me, is that it will also help against insects and diseases. And you use this as a dormant spray on a lot of your trees. Um, except for peaches, peaches, I usually use something else for peaches and nectarines. But for all my other deciduous trees, I'm going to spray this right now. And then I'm going to spray it a second time when the buds start to come out. Right when the buds start to swell and, and change color, then I spray a second time. This is basically an oil. So if there's any eggs lying dormant on that tree, it's going to kill it. And it's going to prevent any diseases and insects on there. The only insect that this, this does not take care of is cotyling moth. And cotyling moth is basically an insect that attacks your apples on your apple tree. But I do have something for that. <coughs> and that one would be this is called Monterey Garden Insect Spray. It is organic, and this one here will take care of coddling moth. This will also take care of leaf miner on your citrus trees. Now citrus trees every year get a thing called leaf miner and that's where your new growth on your tree starts to curl and you see the white track on there. That's leaf miner. This will take care of it. Cottony moth is basically a moth that flies around, lays eggs in your apple flower 
And then when the apple ripens, the co the worm eats its way out. That causes the the hole. So what you want to do with your uh, basically your Monterey carne insect is you use about four tablespoons of this in a gallon of water, and you spray your tree once a week for six weeks. But unfortunately, you have to wait till you see the damage before you can spray the tree. And hopefully we'll be able to save some. Cottony moth on apple trees has been a big problem up in North where they grow them commercially and people have been getting them out here in Southern California too. The next thing to do worry about is your peaches and nectarines. I start spraying liquid cop. Now peaches and nectarines, they get a disease called basically leaf uh, peach leaf curl, I call it. And other people call it something different, but it curls, it makes the tree look like it's from outer space. It won't kill the tree, but what it will do, it will affect your fruit. So when you do the liquid cop, you wanna do that in the fall. Right when you start seeing the peach trees or the nectarine trees giving you the fall color, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and start spraying with that. And that usually happens around August. It's weird that the peaches and nectarines start to give you the fall color. Uh, that early and then in January you do it again and then the same thing so when the buds on the branches start to swell up and they change color then you're going to do one more last application of that that will prevent the peach leaf curl and I always recommend spraying that uh, my peaches and nectarines three times a year with that so those will take care of as a preventative disease but sometimes we get insects on our fruit trees as well because we're not watering enough or we're overwatering. Believe it or not, on a lot of your fruit trees, uh, when we talk about peaches, plums, nectarines, a lot of times they're susceptible to uh, insects called borers. And cherries get it too. And what bore is, is basically a worm, again, that bores itself into the trunk of the tree and starts eating the wood inside that tree. And the problem is what causes the bore, 90% of the time when I see folks that have it is because the tree is under stress. Now, what causes the tree to be under stress? Well, age of the tree. If you have a tree that's 24 years or older and it develops that situation, it could be because the age of the tree and the tree is uh, old. So my recommendation, if I have a 24 year old tree, I tell people don't even bother treating the tree. Uh, enjoy it while it's still producing fruit for you. And if the tree, just know that the tree eventually is gonna go ahead and die on you. Now, if you come to me and say the tree's only three years old or four years old, then I'm gonna tell you, let's treat it. And so we do have something that's basically non-organic. The only time I don't wanna use this is when the tree's in flower. This is basically a fruit tree and vegetable soil drench. This actually goes into your soil. Uh, what you have to do, depending on how big your tree is or whatnot, you use so many ounces per gallon of water and you pour it into the soil. This gives you about a one year protection. The only time I'm gonna ask you not to spray it is in when the tree's in flower. If the tree's in flower, flower don't spray it or don't, don't treat the soil. If there's fruit on the tree, then it's okay to treat the soil. But I don't want you to do it when the tree's in bloom because I don't want to affect any bee activity that might be around. But it's called fruit tree and vegetable systemic soil drench to put out again by Monterey. If you don't want to do the soil drench, and you just want to treat the tree itself without pouring it in the soil, then I've always recommended eight. And eight is something that you could go ahead and spray on your branches and, and, and foliage, but try to get some of the spray into the holes of the trunk too. And you may do this one maybe once a week for probably about three weeks. And hopefully that you, you'll, you'll eradicate it. But like I said, if the tree is older, which I've always, before I even give anybody any recommendations, I always ask them how old the tree is because really if the tree goes 24 years or older, 
then I just tell them, look, it's not worth saving the tree. It's more economical to replace the tree. And, um, and we, even if you replace the tree, there's nothing wrong with your soil. The insect is basically in the tree. So if you take uh, that peach tree out of a place and you plant a peach tree right back in that same hole, you're fine. There's nothing with your soil. Basically, it's in the tree itself. So um, let me also talk a little bit. How can I tell if there's borers on my on my tree? Well, sometimes you'll see sap oozing from the trunks of your tree. And but I'm gonna say that's not hundred percent bore. So what I'll tell you to do is I'll tell you to peel that dry sap off. And if you see like pinholes, like someone took pin and was going up and down your trunk with that or your branches with that then that's a bore. If you peel that sap off and you don't see any pinholes, then that's environmental stress. What people don't realize is that sometimes if we're overwatering our trees, peach trees, plum trees, things of that nature, you will get some sap oozing and that could be an indication of us overwatering. Um, if I, by any chance, um, gets hot well let's just say it got mild it was a mild wet weather and then all of a sudden we went into extreme hot condition that could cause some of your uh, to sap and that is nothing to worry about it's just basically going to clear up on itself but if i'm over watering the tree and it's doing that then i got to cut back my water so but what really attacks the trees is if trees are underwater really um if you're underwater your fruit trees that stresses them out even more and you'll definitely get uh, insects on them. And also you get aphids just like any of the uh, insects and almost any insecticide product will work. Uh, you can even use dishwashing soap and water if you end up with black aphids on your leaves because sometimes in the spring you will get that on your apple trees. I've seen it and also on um, um, peach trees. I've seen it. Apples trees sometimes get white flies too. Those are hard to, those are a little bit harder to uh, get rid of. So that's why a lot of times you may see me recommend this because I could get it through there and I could slowly see any white flies on my fruit trees slowly disappearing on me. And you do got to treat them because believe it or not, if you let your fruit trees go untreated, you're, then you're going to have a lot of uh, trees die from insects because believe it or not i've seen white flies um actually kill a what a 40 year old uh, hibiscus plant going untreated so you definitely want to treat for your insects now um once we get these trees done and um i don't do any i'm a big fan of mulching and one thing about mulching my fruit trees especially my established ones if I plant new fruit trees, I probably won't mulch them this year, but I will probably mulch them next year. I like to use a recyclable mulch. And with the recyclable mulch, it, I, I don't know if you could see, but it's all, what it is, it's all recyclable stuff. Now, I don't want to use colored mulches. I don't want to use cedar mulches, anything of that nature, because my concern is the pH in my soil. Most of your fruit trees, need a pH of about 6.5 and 7.0. The problem is if I use a lot of colored mulches by itself, it leaches all into the soil, then I end up with a pH problem. And then my trees will tend to struggle a little bit. It'll be hard to fertilize them, whatnot. So I always use this one. It's called zero mulch, X-E-R-I-M-U-L-C-H. And it's recyclable mulch. You use about a minimum, I tell people about two inches, depending on where you live. If you live out here in the, out there in the San Fernando Valley or even Santa Clarita, I'm fine if you do three to four inches on him. And this uh, <clears throat> will break down in your soil. However, it will take two years. So you don't have to replenish it that often. You just do it probably about once every two years, mulching on him. If you ever have an issue, and this is what's important, if you're fertilizing your fruit trees, and I'm talking about established ones too, and you're not seeing any results from the fertilizer that you folks are using, 
then it could be a pH problem. And what I mean by that is your pH might be too high. And if you have a high pH in your soil, your fertilizers aren't working properly. So basically you need to do a soil treatment, which I could help you with, is usually there's a product that I sell, it's called Garden Max. And what you would do with Garden Max, and I only would use it because it's uh, on my trees that are struggling, is I will take my hand and I would go out there and scrape dirt off the top of some of the root system. And then I would throw Garden Max right around there as a mulch and water it in. And usually it's organic and usually within six weeks you'll see results. And then you go back to your fertilization uh, issue. Uh, so I only use it on my trees that may be struggling a little bit. And instead of me using the zero mulch on those trees, I may go through my struggling trees and do more of the garden max for them. Because that- I have a question about mulch, Mike. Yes. Um, this zero mulch, is this, uh, is that a brand name or is it, you know, where do we get this? We, we sell it at, at, at Green Thumb. It's actually uh, pr made by Kellogg's, Kellogg's Nursery. Okay, Supreme. all it's, right. It's the same company that you get your different planting mixes from, like Grow Mulch Amend. But Zero Mulch uh, is where we get this from. And it's really the only mulch I would recommend around my trees. So what about the free mulches that cities give away? I've always stayed away from them because I don't know what's in them. Exactly. And you do have to be careful on that because again, that's all clippings and stuff that could have almost anything in there. Almost pine needles could be in there or pine uh, tree branches could be in there. And if you have any pine in there, that definitely will lower your pH in the soil there. Now, what about the people like myself who um, use compost? We compost our kitchen scraps and we mix in fallen twigs and things from our gardens i'm fine with that if you even if you want to use natural leaves um let's say for argument's sake uh, for your peaches all those leaves fall off in the fall and winter time well you could actually leave them right around your trees and use them as your natural mulch if you have your own organic compost yes you could use that but you got to make sure it's not strong you got to make sure it's broken down and everything like that before you use them. But you, but, but the most important thing as well, don't take if you're going to use your organic compost that you've composted down as your mulch. Don't take it right out of the pile and throw it around your trees because um, sometimes you develop grubs, which is caused by a, a June bug that we say they oh, love yeah. organic matter that tend to lay eggs in there. And grubs, if they get into your soil, uh, and then they could eat the root system of your trees and then your trees will start to die. So when you do this, when you do, if you do use your organic compost to mulch your trees, please take a separate wheelbarrow and take a shovel. And as you're digging your compost, you're, you're putting it in a barrel, but at the same time, you're looking to see if there's any grubs in there. And if you find the grubs, you could either pick, you pick them up by hand, throw them to the birds, uh, put them in your pasta, <laughs> with them, but don't, they're not beneficial at all. They go after garbage and they'll, uh, and they, they love organic matter. So that's where a lot of times you'll see grubs. So I'm, like I said, I'm fine with organic composting and using that as a mulch, but just don't take it right out of the compost pile. Put it in a separate wheelbarrow as you're doing it. Thank you. And they also talk about organic, now that uh, you mentioned organic compost. Um, if you're an organic grower, um, I get calls on this all the time of people asking me, um, are your tree fruit trees organic? Well, unfortunately, we're in the state of California. We're number one in agriculture. We have these fruit tree growers have certain regulations they must follow. And that means because of invasive pests that we could have out here in California, they have certain protocols they must uh, follow.
follow and do before they could ship to other nurseries. So it's hard to keep it organically for them due to the protocols. But you as homeowners, you can go ahead and turn that all around and go ahead and grow your trees organically, sure. Just do, just make sure you're not using any chemical fertilizers, make sure uh, your, your, your soils that you're using, mixing in with your native soils organic, like your organic compost. You know, yeah, we could use it as a mulch, but if we're gonna use organic compost out of the bins to plant our trees in, we do wanna mix it with our native soil in there. Um, and then when we spray, you could go ahead and uh, spray organic, organic sprays. Now, when you feed your trees and you're doing it organically, we do carry a wide range of organic products. Now, the Grow Power Plus, the Grow Power Flower and Bloom is not 100% synthetic, but it is half organic and it is half uh, synthetic. So when I have people using the Grow Power Plus and the Grow Power Flower and Bloom early, like I said, you can start feeding in January. It's because the soil is cooler. The synthetic part is going to work in the, fer the fertilizer is going to work the synthetic part into the soil. But when you hit them again during the summertime and you're still feeding through the summer, then that's the organic part working. So when you do your organic fertilizers, like this one here, this is your nitrogen. Um, this is the one you'll use once a month. Unfortunately, we wanna use this one later. Basically, what we're gonna do is we gotta wait till the weather warms up a little bit more, soil temperature warms up. So we would start, if we're doing our trees organically, we would fertilize our trees later organically. And we would still do the once a month up till August for your nitrogen. Just like I said, to get the trees to grow. And then when we're happy with tree size, then you can go ahead and do your organic ultra bloom, which is low in nitrogen. And basically with this, the, we do, again, we'll do this twice a year. We'll do this once in the spring and once in the, uh, uh, August. But our organic products can't be used until the weather warms up. I feel if we use it too early, we're wasting the fertilizer because it's not going to do anything. One thing you also want to keep in mind, again, I don't know if I mentioned it, but when you are doing your fertilization, now most of the trees, and let's say you just planted the trees just this year, most of the trees I have at Green Thumb are between one and two years old. And what they're going to end up doing is they're going to start surprising you and they're going to start producing fruit really, really early. So you can plant that one this year and it may not be fully established, but they will flower and they may produce fruit. You don't want them to produce fruit, especially when you're doing your fertilization. You want to take the fruit off the trees so the energy goes into the growth of the tree. If you leave that fruit on the trees as they're producing, those trees are going to stop growing and focus all their energy in the fruit. We got plenty of time to concentrate on fruit. We just want for the first two to three years, concentrate on growth. And who knows, you know, like I said, if you're five feet and you want to keep the tree at six feet, um, you could probably have achieve that within a year just by feeding them. But just make sure your fruit is take fruit is taken off the trees while you're trying to get them to grow. Also, um, I always get a lot of calls on basically, hey, my fruit tastes good. Why isn't my fruit big enough? What kind of fertilizer can I use to make my fruit big? And unfortunately, there's no fertilizer you can use to make your fruit big. You do got to get out there and thin out your tree for a couple of reasons. It makes your fruit fruit bigger, yes, but it also prevents branches from breaking. A lot of times, these trees are going to produce tons of apples. If you have apple trees, peaches, plums, I mean, it's so much that you don't know what to do with. So I always tell people to take fruit off, go branch by branch and take fruit off, but just make sure you, you make them about a fist distance apart from one another. 
So whatever fruit you leave on the tree, you know, you can make an exercise out of it. Fist, thin, fist, thin, fist, thin. If you get mad at your husband, you can go out there fist, thin, and fist, thin, and fist, thin. The point is, is that you got to give them room because these trees don't know how to distribute their energy out evenly enough. So sometimes your fruit will be small and there's nothing wrong with that. You're still going to have the good flavor, but it could damage your branches and it just won't be big enough for you. So always make sure you're thinning out your fruit. Now, citrus. We don't have to thin out citrus trees fruit. We can let them produce no matter what. Uh, we don't have, we, if, if we're doing a fruit tree orchard just with citrus, we could allow them to produce fruit the first year because they know how to grow and produce fruit the first year. It's your peaches, plums, nectarines, uh, persimmons, pluots. Those are the trees that don't know how to do that. So always remember for the first two to three years to take, take your fruit off till you're happy with tree size. Once you're happy with tree size, then boy, we'll let the trees produce fruit. Also, when you plant your trees, I'm always a big fan of vitamin B1. I'm sure a lot of you folks know about vitamin B1. Well, I used to be a fan of that, but now I'm not anymore. So what I usually recommend is Super Thrive, which is like vitamin B1, but it's 10 times better than vitamin B1. You add about three capfuls of this in a gallon of water and you pour it right into the soil. It actually smells like a vitamin. So, uh, and I would use this, I would do two, no, three applications at three weeks apart <coughs> every time I water. And also, if any of my trees are stressed out, pour some of this also in your a bucket of water and pour this in. This helps cre uh, correct stressed out trees too. So it's a very good uh, beneficial, the guy that did it, his picture's right on here. He passed away at 100 years old, and he swears the reason he has such a good life because he was drinking this stuff. But it's uh, super thrive. So uh, we got through the fertilizations. We talked a little bit about how to create an orchard. You know, planting, we can plant them fairly close together, just different varieties, different ripening dates, and so forth knowing your location where to plant these trees. Now, we have these trees up and they're going good and we get the fruit. And the bad news is I got birds coming in there pecking at my fruit. Or let's say I have blueberries or berries and they're eating my berries. Well, the best thing I could suggest for you is this. This is my friend, Bobblehead Owl, and his head moves around, and I've used him, and what I do is I put him on a stake, you know, tall enough to be just a little bit above my tree. Now, remember, we're doing pruning to keep the tree size under control, so we don't have to do such a big stake, but there's a hole right here that you can put the stake through that that little red thing comes out or brown thing comes out. You put the stake through, you hang him in there, and then the breeze, his head moves around. So it actually scares birds away. Uh, when I worked at Green Arrow many years ago, on our patio, we used to have birds that would poop on our patio and it would just drive me crazy because every morning I'm out there cleaning it or whatever the case is. So I finally put one on top of each one of our swamp coolers there, never had the problem. They went to our loading zone, stayed over there. So. I didn't have to clean the patio up every morning. <laughs> um, Mike? Yes. Does that actually continue to work? We've always thought that the birds are clever and figure it out. No, it, it, it works, but you don't leave it up there all the time. I left mine up there all the time because we had pigeon issues, but you don't leave them up there all the time. You leave it only up there till you're able to harvest the fruit. Once you harvest the fruit, then I would take the owl down so the birds could do whatever they want so they don't get used to it. The reason they do get used to it is because uh, people tend not to take them down and then they realize it's not it, it's a fake. But as long as you actually take it down after you harvest, you're only leaving it up until you're able to harvest the fruit. How about um, 
the rats. It's not going to help uh, the the rats that come for my figs, right? Right. So here, here's the thing we do, and that's a good question. Rats and squirrels are also considered rodents that like to get into your, your fruit. They don't know whether or not the fruit is ripe or not. So sometimes they bite into it and, and, and uh, spit it out. So I usually recommend coyote urine. And coyote urine is actually uh, a granular called shake away. You know, it's, it's a granular, but you got to be careful when you shop for this in the store because the packaging looks the same because we also carry fox urine, fox and coyote urine, or they have one that's just called shake away. Do coyote urine because I know fox urine doesn't work because I think these rodents know there's only coyotes mainly out here. And basically how you do it is you put it in a well ventilated thing. You wait till you get the green fruit on your trees. And I usually recommend pantyhoses. Um, I always tell the guys, you know, steal your wife's and girlfriend's pantyhoses and pour this in there and make ornaments and stick at them into the tree. And when you're done using it, just put the pantyhoses back in their, their uh, drawers and they will never notice the difference. Well, uh, a lot of people have been using it and taking my idea for it. And I had one guy use it last year and the squirrels stayed in his front yard, did not come into his backyard. I had another lady use it on her peach tree many years ago and they stayed right up at the power lines, never came down. The bottom line is, is the way I got this idea was when they used to make coyote urine, they made it in a box where you got two packets two packs of it and it was designed for bird feeders and I looked at that and I said hmm if that could repel squirrels from bird feeders why won't it repel um, squirrels out of fruit trees so squirrels are very smart this was actually designed to sprinkle around the tree squirrels used to just jump from tree to tree to avoid that so we outsmart the squirrels by hanging like coyote urine actually in the trees and they don't like it. They, they sense the predators there in the tree with them so they don't go in there. But you got to start putting it on when the fruit is green. When you start seeing the fruit, you got to start putting it on. Every week, you got to check it because it is granulars and it will dissolve. So you got to check it every week and keep on adding it as you need to. And this goes to, uh, and this will also repel rats too. And once you harvest that fruit, once you harvest that fruit, then take those things down. Because again, we don't want them to get used to it. It's just like the owl, having the birds get used to that. We don't want the squirrels or the rats to get used to this. So you just do it while you're, till you're able to harvest the fruit. But that works like a charm. Nothing else does unless you get a big barking dog or, or something like that. That might help too. But that was a great question. Well, that was a great I answer. I'm so happy to know about that. Yeah, and I'm telling you, if you start using it while you have the fruit and you just keep on adding it, it, they just stay away. They'll go somewhere else, and they may come back after you remove this. But in the meantime, at least you keep them out of your trees until you're able to harvest the fruit. Mike, I have a question about uh, citrus trees. Uh, do you know where uh, you can buy a Mexican lime tree? For me. You've got them, huh? I do. I, I carry 15-gallon semi-dwarfs, and I also have 5-gallon semi-dwarfs as well. Okay. And uh, like I said, they'll produce the first year. Now, keep in mind, lemons produce year-round, and there's one lime that produces year-round. But remember, your Mexican lime's not going to produce year-round. It's going to be more seasonal. But you will get limes every year on them. So... Just understand that they don't produce year-round. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So we got, um, so here's another issue. Let's say you came to me and you said, Mike, I have a pomegranate tree that um, has no seeds in it. Has anybody ever had that issue before? Or let's say you came to me and said, Mike, I have a Santa Rosa plum you sold me. And you told me it was self-fruitful. So why are the fruit falling off? 
Well, all those have to do with not getting enough bee activity to your trees. And like I said, even though you have a cell, bees are very important to when we grow fruit trees. There, there are pollinators and stuff like that. If you ever have that issue, then what's probably happening is either your tree's flowering too early or flowering too late and the bees are gone. Uh, but you can always attract them if they're around when the tree goes and blooms. Also put honeybee attractants into your tree. There's two lures in here, so I usually recommend both lures for both trees. And you put them in there. Because anytime your fruit on a plum tree or peach tree tend to fall off, it is a pollinization problem, but it doesn't mean you need another tree. You just don't have enough bee activity coming to your trees. So you... The sooner you bring the bees in there, then you can move the pollen around. Uh, it also helps with fruit production. And, um, you know, talking about citrus, we were talking a little bit about citrus and a little bit about uh, fruit, fruit trees. Now, you know, we back up on citrus, like the Mexican lime or, or whatnot. One thing about California, we are number two in citrus growing, so we could plant citrus any time of the year. Um, I will say this, and I'm glad he asked uh, about the question on the Mexican lime, because I know I do have those. Uh, the problem is, is there is a shortage on citrus trees due to COVID. Uh, with the shortage we have is I think when COVID first hit, everybody stayed home and they were guarding like crazy because, and that's exactly what I would do. We were open during the whole COVID, but if we were ever closed, I'd be out there in my yard planting too, because nothing was open. I didn't want to look at the four walls and I wanted, I need to do something. So um, everybody was planting things. And we all know that in this industry, citrus is probably the slowest growing thing that we as a nursery carry. So when everybody was buying things and we're ordering every week almost citrus, everything was going right out the, out the door. Now that everything kind of calmed down a little bit, now it's hard for us to get some varieties of citrus. It's not that because the growers don't have it, they do have it, but because it's one of the slowest things to grow, it's hard to have backup stock. It's uh, what well, we got new crops coming in. They're on the grounds, but they're still too small to ship. So what I've been doing at Green Thumb is I've been looking at availabilities every week and that's what made me excited when he asked about uh, Mexican lions, because when I see those things on the availability list, I just don't bring one or two. I'm bringing in five or 10 of them because that's one of my A items. And I still have Mexican limes in stock too, because uh, I was actually looking at them before um, uh, my time off. Uh, last time I saw uh, was, uh, when was it? Uh, Tuesday, we had quite a bit. And like I said, they're going to produce fruit, uh, you know, citrus, you can allow produce fruit the first year. Mexican limes uh, will produce fruit the first year, but you just won't get the fruit year round. Mike, as long as we're talking about citrus and do you have any, I'm hoping for a long time to get that sumo tangerine. Is that available yet? No. And I remember when that was uh, first in an article, I was working at Green Arrow and someone brought it in. And I honestly did research on that. And I found out that, it's all, that it is being grown, but it's only being sold to commercial growers right now. And um, I think there's a contract that these growers have with these commercial growers. And I don't know if they're gonna be available anytime soon. Um, it could happen um, because uh, some I do see some nurseries coming up with things that they had contracts with, with farmers markets and stuff like that are now making it available for nurseries to carry. But yeah, that, that, that tangerine is actually a commercial growers thing right now, but maybe eventually it will hit the nurseries, but I don't know when. Mike, I have a tangerine question. My tangerine just finished harvesting and it did, fabulous this year can i prune it now and what when should i feed it well uh you can go ahead and prune them um i would probably wait till next month if you can to prune your tangerine because yes, the yes in the spring because it's going to flush out with new growth i'm just afraid of the cold weather i'm not sure what the wet weather is going to do but right. if you wait till uh, mid-march 
uh, I think you're going to be okay. And then we can feed it at the same time. And my fertilizer on, on citrus is going to, I recommend feeding them three times a year. I'll recommend citrus growers blend in the spring. I will recommend EB Stone citrus and fruit tree fertilizer in the early summer. And then citrus growers blend again in the fall. Citrus growers blend is your micronutrients. And it's very important that you have micronutrients in, in, in the soil. Because if your fruit comes out of whack or the flavor's out of whack, 90.9% .9 of the time is you don't have enough micronutrients into the soil. So that's very important that you keep on keeping that going. But that's the fertilizer I would recommend. And whatever you're doing in terms of watering your citrus, please don't change it. Do because that's also number one reason why people aren't successful with citrus is because they tend to overwater their citrus. Uh, but whatever you're doing, don't change a thing. And, um, and, and also remember this, you got a bumper crop this year. Remember, tangerines like to take a year off in between crops. So remember next year, they might be on vacation. Got it. Thank you. And then uh, while we're still talking a little bit about citrus, uh, we do have issues with ants. And I'm sure a lot of people, that's one of the insects that come up there. Now what ants are gonna do when they start climbing into your fruit trees, and I've seen them on plums and peaches, they're actually bringing insects into your trees. So what's very important is, let's take care of the ant problem first. So what you do is you take a band, this is called a tangle foot band, and it's the same thing with citrus. They're not hurting your fruit, they're actually bringing insects into your tree. This is tangle foot band. Now, when I see ants climbing on my trunk and going in my tree, I'm gonna wrap this thing around the trunk of my tree up to the first branches. And then once the tangle foot band is on, then I actually have the tangle foot itself. And I'll take a putty knife and I'll just scrape it right on the, on the band, all the way around the band. And what that does is it makes the ant stick to it. And I may leave it on, uh, on there for about three weeks just to make sure because what I need to do after I take care of the ant problem, I have to check my leaves and see if I have an insect problem. And if I have an insect problem on my leaves, then what I want to do is I want to start my spraying and get rid of the insects. Once I get rid of the insects and I don't, and all my ants are, don't see any more ants climbing in my tree, then I'm going to take this off and I should be good to go. Um, because uh, once the insects are gone as well, there's no reason why ants need to be in my tree again. So that's how you get rid of your ants and, and, and keep them out of your tree. They don't kill your tree, they don't affect your fruit, but they're bringing insects into your tree that can harm your tree. And most of that's gonna be white flies uh, or aphids that they're doing up there. So Mike, the reason that you put the tangle guard there is so you're protecting the trunk from when you put the tangle foot on? That's correct. I'm just using this to, uh, uh, just to protect the trunk when I put the tangle foot on. Exactly right. I don't put this on the pure trunk. I use the band because I'm not leaving it up there permanently. I'm going to get it down after I take care of the problem. Thanks. Now, I want to just touch base a little bit on grapes because that's another thing that's actually becoming... Uh, very popular now since COVID is here. And people plant grapes, either they're doing wine grapes or table grapes. Uh, last year I sold out a lot of grapes. This year I'm selling a lot of grapes. So I don't think that's actually going to stop. So my recommendation is one thing I do remember, I always let people know, is that grapes can be a little bit more drought resistant than your peaches and plums and nectarines. I mean, I'm still going to water them when I first plant them. Every other day when it's hot, every three days during the cool month. <clears throat> but once they're in the ground for a year, I'll come back my water down maybe once a week, once every couple weeks uh, because they are drought resistant. But when my grapes start to produce fruit, then I have to increase my watering to twice a week, three times a week. Because if I don't water my grapes enough when they have fruit on there, then my fruit shrivels up like raisins and that means I'm not watering them enough. 
So it's very important that I basically uh, treat it as a drought resistant plant when I don't have fruit, but increase my watering when I do have fruit. Now grapes go dormant just like all our other fruit trees. And the main disease that I've ever seen, I've never really seen, there's only one insect that I gotta be concerned about on grapes that I've ever seen on grapes is what we call glass and wing sharpshooter. And what that insect does, it looks like a leaf hopper and it could suck juice out of your grape in a half a second. And sometimes you can feel the liquid or you can see the liquid. And this insect is so smart that even if you see the insect on top, it dodges the spray, anything you try to spray at it and laughs at you. So that's where that soil drench comes in as well. If you ever develop that glass wing sharpshooter, this is what I'm gonna recommend to you to treat your grapes if you ever have it. But <coughs> if I'm gonna take care of my diseases and, and, and fungus, like powdery mildew and stuff, sulfur dust. I use one tablespoon of sulfur dust in a gallon of water. And what I do is I'll spray my grapes with this probably about once a week, uh, all the way up to summertime. And when do I start spraying sulfur dust is when my grapes start to come out of dormancy and my growth is about an inch long, I start my spraying with the sulfur dust once a week, all the way up till summer. Once summer hits, I'm done spraying it and I should be good to go. And I still use the same type of fertilizers on them, either Grow Power Plus, Grow Power Flower and Bloom. It depends on what I want the grapes to do. But always remember this. I do not prune my grapes for a year. I let it, when I first plant them, I let them go for the year. Second year is when I'll play with them and start pruning them or whatnot and stuff like that. But I don't prune them for about a year. I let them grow and let them do what they want for a year. So I hope I answered most of the questions um, and fruit trees. I think it's a great idea. That, that's what a lot of folks are doing now. Um, I have customers saying, if I got to water my trees, I might as well produce something. I have folks taking their lawn out of their backyard just to get ready for their fruit trees. And, and I, do see, uh, I, I do see as we move forward that we're going to have more and more uh, edibles going on. On to Mike, I, I wanted to ask you, I, I tried to get, get in before when you're on citrus. Do you want to mention something about the citrus Asian psyllid when we're on about oh, that's, citrus? That's a, yeah. Uh, so anyways, when you come into a nursery, you're going to actually see quarantine tags on the trees. Now, as a nursery industry, we, uh, uh, we're keeping a close eye on this Asian citrus psyllid. We do get inspected uh, constantly. And that's why sometimes it's also hard to get deliveries here on time uh, because growers have to treat their citrus trees before they could ship them. So all of us are in a quarantine area and I believe uh, everywhere, all of Southern California, as far as Northern Ventura County, Northern California, we're in a quarantine called Asian citrus psyllid. And what it is, it's basically an insect that actually, uh, attacks the tree. And we believe right now at this point that that insect uh, basically spreads a disease called HLB or commonly known as citrus greening disease. Now, if a tree gets citrus greening disease and you have a 60 year old tree, that tree will be dead in two years. That's how, and there's no cure for it. So one of the things I always tell people is to keep an eye on is the Asian citrus psyllid. And what we're working for, looking for is not too much the adults, but more of the nymphs. And the nymphs look like aphids on that tree. And again, the sure way to get rid of Asian citrus psyllid, if you have it, is you could spray it, the leaves with a product called Seven or you could spray the leaves with a product called Safer Insecticidal Soap, and you do the soil drench. Now, my recommendation on the Asian citrus psyllid, and let me explain this. We never had this product online. Las Vegas, 
uh, Nevada had this product. And this was featured at a trade show up that way many years ago. They hurried up and, uh, you know, everybody knows California is very strict on what gets uh, uh, allowed out here for spraying and stuff like that. Well, this got, this got approved to be sold out here in California pretty quick when we realized what this product had, ingredients it had and what this product can do. So what I do recommend to everybody is regardless, at the very minimum, once a year, you should go out there and put this into the soil around all your citrus trees. Uh, this you can use as a preventative method too. You don't have to wait till you have the problem. You can use this as a preventative method. Um, the only time again, you don't use this is when the trees are in flower. If the, if the trees have fruit on it, by all means, go ahead and use it. This is not gonna affect the fruit. Just don't use it when the tree's in flower. If you miss it because the tree's in flower, then wait till the flower is done, then use it. But it's called the Monterey Fruit Tree and Vegetable Systemic Soil Drench. I recommend everybody treat their citrus with this uh, at least once a year because this will give you about a one-year protection. Right now, I do know uh, LA, uh, CDFA, or it could be the USDA, and maybe LA County Ag. If they see citrus in your backyard, they're gonna probably knock on your door and ask if they could come in and put some traps in there. Uh, go ahead and allow them to do that. All they're doing is just tracking the Asian citrus cylinders where, where it's been spotted. Um, Sometimes if they notice your tree has HLB, which is citrus screening disease, then what generally happens is they put up a big quarantine, even in your neighborhood, and you can't remove fruit from your neighborhood. You can share with your, 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 your neighbors, but you can't move it. And they'll come in your yard and they'll pull the tree out. Uh, but that's how serious it is. It's just a way to protect because like I said, we're number two in citrus growing and we're just trying to protect the agriculture. And so far, we've, uh, there's been a few places, uh, uh, a couple places in San Diego County where they found some trees that developed HLB. Uh, and they also found a tree uh, years ago uh, in High Santa Heights that had HLB. And, and I don't know anywhere else they did, but there has nothing been nothing closer to uh, the store where I'm at because what happens is if they put up a quarantine and I'm in my stores in that quarantine, I can't sell citrus. I actually might have to destroy my whole inventory and citrus is not allowed to be sold. So that's why I, I try to educate people about, you know, doing your soil drench at least once a year because you're not even help your you're, you're helping your own trees, but if there's any nurseries near you, you're helping them too, because if, you know, you're protecting your trees. So in the same way, you're helping us where maybe we won't end up with the HLB where, we, where us as a nursery can't sell trees anymore. So that's it. And it's, it's a very bad thing, but uh, uh, there's, there's still recording and stuff like that and still taking care of it. So um, hopefully this will be an, another thing uh, in the books too. So, cause every year I always tell people, well, what's gonna be our next invasive pest? Now we had the fire, red imported fire ants. Then I find out this Asian citrus still, oh my God, it's gonna be here in LA County in a year, but it was here in a shorter period of time of year because they found an Asian citrus still originally you know, right by Los Angeles Dodger Stadium. So, um, yeah, we're just keeping a close eye on it. And, and that's why the quarantine tags are. It doesn't mean you can't care, buy the tree and take it home. All we're just telling you, well, uh, well, it tells the CDFA that those trees have been treated basically if they, when they come and inspect me. Because if I have a tree that doesn't have those tags, they make me destroy it. So there you go. A little insight. Um, one thing that um, we also tell people if, um, they have fruit trees to stop spreading anything that might be there. Make yeah. sure that when you give your fruit away, you don't give your fruit away with any part of the tree left on it. So yeah. some people like to give away a fruit that has a little bit of a twig or a leaf. You don't want to do that with this. No, you didn't. You, you, you do not. You just want to go ahead and 
give them the fruit, wash your fruit. Uh, the branches could be thrown away. Well, not even thrown away. Sometimes they would recommend you burning them or whatnot in that case. But just so you know, you can see the Asian citrus psyllid if you do have it. It does look like uh, aphids, black aphids. And, um, and when you do develop that, if you do see them, you definitely want to do the soil drench, but you have to do a foliage spray. You have to do uh, either the seven or insecticide or soap. You have to spray them. Um, but if you don't see them, then it's better to just do the preventative of the soil drench. So if you could get the word out with people, your friends or neighbors um, with uh, citrus and letting them know that's how we could kind of prevent the Asian citrus psylla from attacking our trees, basically. And that's why they first came out with it. And, and like I said, I was pushing this like crazy at the nurseries, you know, letting them know how important it is for you as homeowners um, to do that because it does help us nurseries out. And, and that's one thing Plant California Alliance wanted all the retailers to do. Please tell your public to start treating uh, the trees. I mean, and a lot of this stuff, if I don't know if anybody knows this, but you see Riverside out here actually has orchards themselves and they've done a lot of testing for the nursery industry. I know we use UC Davis or Cal Poly sometimes, but UC Riverside was the star of this whole thing because they're the ones that uh, tested a lot of stuff on their citrus, especially some of the ones that did have citru Asian citrus psyllid. And that's how we found out that the seven or the insecticidal soap or the soil drench worked because they, they, those were all tested at UC Riverside. Uh, Mike, I yes. have uh, blueberries, two blueberry bushes, but they're really yellow. And last year I bought the acid fertilizer and everything. It didn't seem to help. Okay. What do I need to do with these four things? Well, if they're turning yellow. That means your pH did go up. And what you're going to want to do now is hit them with a handful of soil sulfur. Oil sulfur, okay. Yeah, that's what you do originally. To keep the pH down, probably about a month after you do the soil sulfur. Usually I tell people to do the soil sulfur in January, but you're fine right now. Anytime you leave the turn yellow, it just basically means your pH went up. Uh, what acid fertilizer were you using originally? I don't remember the name of it. But I'm going to recommend cottonseed meal for you as well. What's the name again? Cottonseed meal. Okay. That's put, both of them are put out by E.B. Stone. So you're going to go home and you're going to throw a handful of soil sulfur around each plant and water it in. That's going to make sure your pH gets lowered. Then a month later, you're going to do the cottonseed meal handful around each plant. And we're going to do that once a month up to probably September. And that's going to keep your soil acidified. Okay. And, and then in January again, after we stop feeding them, I mean, because we're going to feed them with cottonseed meal once a month up till September will be our last month. Then we got October, November, December, we're not going to feed them. And then in January, you'll hit them with soil sulfur again. Okay. And then you do the cottonseed all over again. Okay. So that, that'll definitely green them up because soil sulfur is automatically going to bring your pH back down to acidicness, lower your pH. Yay. Okay. Thank I you mean, very much. Just make sure you do a handful around each plant though. Yes, I okay. will. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Do we have more questions for Mike? I do. Yes. Uh, I want to ask if I have some, uh, there are miniature apples, and if I want to start to see if I could grow those from the seeds, is it possible? <laughs> yes. I mean, a lot of your trees uh, will go, grow from seed, uh, just like you do a peach tree from seed, and you'll still, 
but I just don't know exactly because a lot of your trees are grafted uh -huh. and a lot of times uh, they come up with, uh, so with them not being grafted and just growing from seed, uh, we don't know what the quality of the fruit will be. We don't know if it's going to turn out to be the same as uh, that apple you ate or, uh -huh. or not. but yeah, they will, you could grow them from seed, sure. And maybe later on, if to you it seems like that tree produces and the fruit's not that good, we could probably graft it later down the road. Oh, okay. It was from a, it was a, it's a really small apple, but it was very tasty. It must have been an ultra, um, a dwarf. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing is, is growing fruit trees from seed. Uh -huh. It'll take time for you to get uh, some fruit, but uh, um, we just don't know what the quality of the fruit will be like. It may look really good to you. It's just like, for example, I'll use a fig, for example. Um, a lot of times people get fig trees volunteering in their yard because rodents and stuff get into the fruit and they spit out the seeds in someone else's yard. And that's how you end up with the tree then all of a sudden you get this beautiful looking fig on there. Oh my God, that tastes, and when you eat it, oh my God, it tastes horrible. Oh. <laughs> Even though the fruit may look good. So that's usually because it's grown from the seed. So we don't know exactly what the quality of the fruit's gonna be, but it's worth trying. Okay, uh, yeah. another quick question. Um, I have I, I have ultra dwarf uh, Meyer lemons and it's only grown up to maybe, I mean, not maybe up to four feet at the most. That's the maximum it will get. Okay, great. And it, but it gives me huge lemons. It's uh, yeah. Well, what it, we call them dwarf trees, but uh, unfortunately, this USDA doesn't like us to call them dwarf like we used to because uh, we call them semi dwarfs because most of your citruses uh, can get about ten to twelve feet tall. But the only one that still stays small would be that Meyer lemon. I always tell people four to five feet high, that Meyer lemon is almost a true dwarf. It's an improved variety, but it's a true dwarf. Oh, okay, great. Oh, good. I'm glad. I've been. It's. I've had it for 13 years, and that's as that's as far as it's gotten. But they give me. I do get some big lemons from that. Yeah. So whatever you're doing, don't change anything. They're doing a good job. But it's actually, Thank you. it's it's actually the biggest it's going to be. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mike. You're welcome. Well, Mike, I, I have to say, I I just feel like I went to university. Um, <laughs> and But I know that we're all going to have more questions as time goes by. And we know where to find you. <laughs> so we'll come up to New Hall and and buy some sulfur if we have and cottonseed meal for our blueberries and maybe pick up one of your Mexican limes. Uh, this has been great for me. Do, do any of you, oh, Anne is nodding. Do any of you uh, have any more questions or shall we just applaud him and, and thank him? <laughs> <laughs>